Christ is risen. He is risen I'm going to try to get the colors right on this. Christ is risen. risen Let's stand. Hear this word from scripture. Come all you who are thirsty and come to the waters and you have, who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fear. Give ear and come to me and listen that you might live. Let's worship the Lord. Sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, tis music in the sinner's ears. Is life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, to praise ye dumb. Tongues employ. Be blind, behold your Savior come and leave ye jailing for joy. My gracious Master and my friend assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad. The Amen, amen. I'm going to read the text, um, Revelation chapter 4. You don't need to open I'll read it for you. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, amen. who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. Hallelujah. He loves you. He loves. He's, he is our God. He is our Savior. He's the one that keep us. He's our source of life. Thank you, Jesus. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I'll praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. Oh, dear. 
exalted on high. I'll praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. For He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Majesty, Lord. You are our Lord, our King, and we need you, Lord. We need your power this morning. We need your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. Come as we sing that salvation belongs to you, Lord. Salvation comes from you. And we want to sing songs to exalt your name, Lord.
Aleluia. Thank you, Jesus, for the joy and the peace we found in you and only you. As we are here this morning, just look around. I want you to, to say good morning, and you are welcome in the church of Jesus Christ. You are welcome here in this place. You watching us online, feel the presence and the peace of Jesus in your house, in your home right now. You guys must know my my parents are here thank you Jesus for their presence here
Um, we're so glad everyone's here today. I wanted to start with some good news, and that is that Derek made it safely to India. So praise the Lord for that. Also, there's a lot of different things happening in the life of the church. Um, on April 27th, if you look in your bulletin, there's this little handout here. There's going to be a membership study on April 27th. So if you have been coming for a little while and you're interested in learning more about who we are as Free Methodists, who we are as a church, we encourage you to come to that. You can talk to a pastor about putting your name on the list for that. And then on the 11th of May, there's going to be a spiritual gifts seminar. So that'll be really interesting to come and learn about the ways that God has gifted you and how... The, He's done that so that you can serve the body of the church. Also, there are small groups that are meeting. If you're not a part of a small group, I really encourage you to be a part of one. It's a great way to get to know people in the church and to study the word of the Lord together. Um, also, on Wednesday, there will be prayer meetings, so you can dial in on Zoom or come here to the church for that. And finally, I wanted to draw your attention to this insert in the bulletin. Um, our superintendent, Dave Harvey, served the Acts 12 24 conference for 25 years, and he recently just retired. Um, we just want to bless him with a gift to say thank you for all of his years of service. So we're going to be taking an offering today um, for a gift for him. So if you'd like to participate in that, you can put it in the regular offering. There's envelopes in your bulletin, so you can just stick it in there. That's going to be for Dave Harvey. So we're glad you're here today. bulletin, if, if you want to um, especially give the gift to Dave offering, put it in the envelope in, in, your, uh, in your bulletin this morning, or there should be one near you in the pew. You could put it in the offering plate, or for a lot of people, even though we announced this last week, I know we all forget, amen? So you could put it in at the end of the service, but we want to bless uh, Dave Harvey in this time. So let's continue to worship as the offerings received. Children can be dismissed to children's worship. so good. God is so Let's pray. Lord, we came here today in communion 
with each other, reserving this time only for you, God, to offer you praise and worship, to hear you speak to us, and to live here shaped a little bit more the likeness of Jesus Christ. This is your house, and we are your people. God, expand our capacity to be in your, in your presence, Jesus. We want to know you, Lord. Would you show us your glory, just as Moses asked? Show us your glory, God. Show us your face. We recognize that you are here. And now we honor your holy presence. Lord, we ask for us to see you this morning. Burning hearts to know Jesus. I ask you, Lord, that you distill every heart in the room, every mind. Remove every distraction. And may this morning, Jesus, we can see you, your beauty, your splendor. That our eyes would burn with first love it again. Yes, Jesus. Pour, pour out your spirit, Lord, on the young and the old. Pour out your spirit. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. We yield our bodies. We submit our wills. We submit our lives. We give you the glory and honor for all that you are doing in your lives every day. Even in the times we can't see it or understand your ways. Shine your light in us, through us, and over us. May you make a difference wherever we go for your glory and purpose. See, set your way before us. May our, your plans succeed. We believe that it is not by mighty, not by power, but by your spirit that they make a difference in our world. We choose to trust in you today and to recognize the authority of who you are in our lives, God. Help us to keep our eyes on you so that we can follow your promptings and respond to your call. Forgiveness for being too busy or distracted by other things, for not fully recognizing what you freely gave what you did for us. Open doors that no one can close, Lord. Protect your people as we carry the truth of Jesus to our community and to any other place that the Lord wants to take us. We pray for families from our church. Give them great strength, protection, and grace for the days ahead. We ask in you to continue to show the way for strong and faithful men and women to serve your people. We ask in you for the outpouring, outpouring of your spirit to raise those you have chosen, chosen to lead. The battle seems intense some days, God. We get tired, we fear, and weak. But help us remember that you will never leave us that you are our refuge and our strength, a happy always present in trouble. Holy Spirit, revive us today. Surprise us with your power and your presence as we gather. Heal the sick. Speak words of faith Amen. and comfort. Bind up broken hearts. Grant us repentance. Pour out your gifts of grace and renew our hearts for Jesus. As we prepare to hear our word preached, help us to focus and listen. Bless and use the life of Pastor Doug for your honor and glory. Encourage us in the areas we need to be encouraged. Do this all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Heavenly Father, as we approach your word this morning, we ask that you hearts to listen, um, to respond faithfully to your word, Lord. Forgive us, cleanse us, help us, Lord, as we prepare to look into your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just some information as we begin. Um, all of us probably have calendars, right, on our phones or on hanging in a wall in our kitchen somewhere maybe, 
And as a nation, right, and as a world, we celebrate certain holidays every year, like Labor Day, um, Fourth of July, uh, all different kinds of things we focus on. But the church also has a calendar where we focus on different things. It's one of the reasons why uh, the cloth on the altar changes at different seasons in the church year. And we are in a period of time uh, in the church calendar known as the Easter season, right? It's a, it's a special 50-day period between Easter and Pentecost where we celebrate the fact that Christ is risen. risen Amen. So uh, we don't always take this whole 50 days to focus on that, but I think we're going to do it. I just feel led of the Holy Spirit to do that this year. Uh, but really, every Sunday we celebrate, when we gather on Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to explore another one of the resurrection accounts and how it impacts our lives and how it especially impacted the life of one of the early disciples. And it's, uh, uh, it's a disciple that uh, is well known, um, not only in the church, but outside of the church. It's not Peter. Peter was the one that Jesus called the rock. It's not Matthew, the famous tax collector. It's not Judas. I, I actually spoke about him on Easter Sunday. It's not even John, whose gospel we're going to read from this morning. So just to warm up a little bit to get ready, you should find a Bible and open up to John uh, chapter 20 so you can follow along with us this morning. It's interesting that this disciple... Um, Thomas, uh, that we're going to focus on, is not one of the better known. We, don't, we, we know who he is, but he is even known outside of the church. Even if people didn't realize that he, don't realize that he is one of the 12 disciples, we know him as a proverb. Uh, he's the proverbial example of a person who struggles with doubt. Doubting Thomas. So that label that we give him, that we often use to describe a person uh, who struggles with doubt in whatever field, uh, is an unfair label biblically for many reasons. First off, because of all the disciples, of, of all the 12 disciples of Jesus, according to church history, it was Thomas who traveled further than any of the other disciples. He traveled all the way to India. We know that because one of the oldest Christian groups in the world calls itself the Church of St. Thomas. It's located in southern India. I have been there. I've been to more than one of the, the churches of St. Thomas. I actually, when I was in Chennai, India, I got to pray at what they claim is the tomb of St. Thomas. So for a doubter, Thomas acquitted himself pretty well, right? Travels all the way to India after the resurrection. But secondly, singling out Thomas as this great doubter is unfair because each and every one of the disciples struggled with doubt. Peter and John doubted. According to John's account in John chapter 20, verse 9, those early disciples reached the empty tomb they examine the grave clothes. They're there. They see the empty tomb and the grave clothes. And here's what it says. They doubted because they still did not understand the scripture that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. And then in John's account, there's Mary. Mary Magdalene, the one from whom Jesus had delivered uh, from seven demons. She enters the tomb after them sees the same evidence as Peter and John. And there's these two angels that appear to her in the tomb. Although at first she, she doesn't realize they're angels, because right angels frequently appear in scripture as human beings. She didn't know they were, were angels. So she sees the empty tomb. She sees the same thing that Peter and John see. And this is her great statement of faith. Sirs, someone has taken my Lord's body away and I don't know where they've put him. And then there's another, uh, our, then there's the fearless disciples. They're spoken of, you don't have to turn there, kind of stay in the Gospel of John. In Luke 24, 37, 
who when Jesus first appears to these disciples in the Gospel of Luke, uh, their first response was that they were startled and frightened because they thought they had seen a ghost. And, And even after, he shows them his hands and his feet, similar to what happens in the passage we're going to read this morning. They still did not believe, right? They see the wounds. They don't believe, it says, because of fear and amazement. And and the way they, they finally get convinced that Jesus was not just a ghost or an apparition and that he actually had a physical resurrected body, they're finally convinced in the Gospel of Luke, verse 42, because he takes a piece of broiled fish and he eats it in their presence. So one of the reasons I believe the Bible is you just can't make this stuff up, right? Throughout these stories, there's doubt and faith just all mingled together. All of them, though, in this story, at some point, doubted. Thomas wasn't alone. Uh, Doubt is the expected response of each and every one of us because uh, dead people don't get up and just walk outside, walk outside of the grave. That, that doesn't happen too often. So we're going to focus on Thomas. Open up to John 20, beginning verse 24. You need to follow along with this story. The Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 4, begins this way. And Thomas, called Didymus, known as Didymus, um, which was his Greek name, which meant twin, uh, Didymus, Uh, was the Aramaic version of that name, which is so important because Jesus very probably, in addition to speaking some Hebrew, spoke Aramaic. It says this, so Thomas, the twin, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came to them the first time. So the other disciples told him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He was here. Now the scriptures don't say why Thomas wasn't there the first time the disciples were gathered. They don't tell us. You know, I've preached sermons using this as an example of why we should come to church on Sunday because when you come to church on Sunday, you never know when Jesus may actually show up. Amen? So I've preached sermons like that. And I kind of repent of that a little bit this morning. And it really wasn't fair because Thomas is never rebuked by anyone in this text for not being there. Nobody chides him that he wasn't there when Jesus showed up. He just wasn't there. Uh, Maybe he was running an errand. Maybe he was out buying food for the group. We don't know. Maybe he had had to get his donkey inspected at the Jerusalem Department of Motor Vehicles. Right? We don't know what was happening in his life. Maybe he had a rough night's sleep. He just couldn't get up in the morning. Uh, Or maybe, and I think this is the most likely, He just didn't grieve like the rest of the disciples, right? People grieve differently. Some people, when they're grieving, uh, like lots of people around, they don't want to be alone. Other people, when they're grieving, have to be left alone. And neither one is wrong. The point is, we, we, we don't know the reason. The text does not tell us why Thomas was not there the first time. He just wasn't there. So whatever the reason, we're going to find out as we read through this story that Jesus wasn't upset with him. At no point does Jesus tell Thomas that he was upset with him. He's not rebuked, he's not rebuked for, for not being there. There's no judgment that's passed on his absence, which just says to me we need to be very careful about passing judgment on people. Amen? The only thing he experiences in the rest of this story is an answer for the questions that he had. Look at verse 25. So the other disciples tell tell him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I'm not going to believe. So remember I read earlier in Luke chapter 24 that the other disciples asked for the same thing 
except they didn't request this hands-on and hands-in kind of inspection, right? But Thomas was different. Thomas's doubts ran deeper than the rest of the disciples, and we need to be careful, again, not to judge him too harshly. Remember, he wasn't there when Jesus showed up. He wasn't there the first time. He wasn't with Mary Magdalene when the angels answered her questions. He didn't run to the tube with Peter and John and, and see the empty tomb and the grave clothes. He didn't have the same experiences that they had, and that's so important to remember. Because many of the doubters around us haven't had the same experiences that we've had. Many, many people have had very difficult experiences that cause them even to doubt the existence of God. So again, we, we don't want to judge. And we need to remember there are all kinds of doubters out there. People doubt for all different kinds of reasons. There are doubters because they doubt because of what they consider a lack of hard evidence. So as a young man, I spent some time in Kenya. And I would read scripture that would be translated into the local dialect, which was Turkana. It was the northern part of Kenya. It was very hot. I mean, it was always, it seemed like it was always 100 degrees in the shade at least. And I was reading a scripture with a group of people from Turkana once that mentioned snow. And I was trying to describe to them what snow was because they had never seen snow in this particular part of Kenya. And uh, they, they, they were very skeptical, and they thought I was pulling their leg, for those of you who know that expression, because they knew I had this habit of pulling people's legs, right, and, and, and saying things to make people think. So, uh, so I, it was hard for them because they had never seen snow. They had never had any hard evidence that there was even a thing called snow. And we didn't have a refrigerator where I was for a long time. So um, it was hard to even find something to convince them. Some people doubt uh, because of hard evidence. Some people doubt for intellectual reasons. They struggle with Christianity and with the Bible because the, the things that they read are so fantastic. And they are fantastic. Um, and they believe that they lived in a closed universe where God is incapable of intervening in the affairs of men. And they forget the fact, right? They forget the fact that many, if not most, of the greatest thinkers and historians and scientists throughout history acknowledge that there has to be something more going on in the universe because of the complexity and the structure that is all around us. And they don't know, they don't know what it is, but, but many of them know that there has to be something out there. There are other people who, who struggle um, for philosophical reasons. Nietzsche, who said, all of the great intellects are skeptical. To be intelligent is to be skeptical. Diderot said, skepticism is the first step towards truth. Or Descartes, who said, if you would be a real seeker after truth, you must at least once in your life, as far as possible, doubt everything. So I, I don't read those three philosophers too frequently. Thank God for Google, amen? So I, I tend, uh, there, were, there was a, a great jazz musician by the name of Fats Waller. I, I identify much more with him who said, in his answer to skepticism, said this, one never knows, do one. Yet, of all the different kinds of doubt, people have doubt, I believe the most difficult kind of doubt to recover from is a doubt that's born of disappointment. It's the hardest of all. That was Thomas's problem. And I believe for us, when we doubt, that is the problem for most of us. We doubt at some level in our life because we've been disappointed. We pray to God for something, and we don't get the answer that we hoped for. So we doubt. We believe God for a certain outcome. Things don't turn out the way we expect, so we doubt. One writer says it, describes it this way. 
He says, the deepest kind of doubt is the doubt that is born of sorrow, the kind that arises from the experiences of our lives. The greatest kind of doubt is not the kind of doubt that doubts the Bible. That's not the greatest kind of doubt. The greatest kind of doubt is not the kind of doubt that's born in a laboratory or in some college classroom. That's not the greatest kind of doubt. The greatest doubt is the kind of doubt that is born in the laboratory of our souls, inside of us. Dark experiences and tragedies that we've been through that we just don't have an answer, an answer for. The doubt of a man who questions the virgin birth is one thing, but let it not, but, but don't be confused with the doubt of a mother who has just lost her firstborn child and doesn't know why and wonders if God even exists. That's the most profound kind of doubt. The doubt of someone who questions the account of creation, as, as is recorded in the book of, of Genesis, is not the same kind of a doubt who sees all the hatred and violence that's going on in the world around us and says, where is this God of creation? How come he lets it get like this? The doubt that Thomas displayed is not any of those kinds of doubts. It's, it's not the doubt of the scientist or the skeptic, or the critic, but it's the doubt of a man who has lost his master and Lord, and his best friend, and who doubts if he's, if he's ever coming back, who feels totally alone at this point in the story. So how does Jesus handle doubt like that? Our text says, a week later, the disciples are in the house again, and Thomas is there. Though the, I love this part of the story. Though the doors were locked, Jesus comes in, stands right amongst them. What must that have been like? Isn't it great that even when we lock the doors of our life, God has a way of getting in. He surprises us. The things that seem to happen to us in life that frequently we, we call coincidences are really not coincidences at all. And God is trying to get through to us. And when he gets in, when he walks through the closed doors, first thing he says to Thomas is, peace be with you. Peace, Thomas. Isn't it, isn't it good to know that for all the things we've done in our lives, all the doubts and all the questioning, all of our choosing to go, God says go, go right and we decide to go left, all the, all the going of our own way, that God still shows up in our life and meets us with peace. Isn't that amazing? It's just amazing to me. So he comes to Thomas and says, Thomas, go ahead. Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hands, Thomas. Put it into my side. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. You know, it's interesting, Thomas never actually does that. Because he doesn't need to. He doesn't need to. So you know what I love about this? Jesus loves an honest doubter. Jesus loved Thomas. And he loves you and me. Even when we question, even when we go through the hard times. But he, he not only loves an honest doubter, but he pursues them. Jesus pursued Thomas. He encourages him. But that is not the only reason 
He showed up on Sunday night in our story. It's not the only reason he comes to Thomas. He, he comes uh, not only to answer the doubt, but he comes to meet with Thomas. You know, God wants all of us to have a Thomas moment in our life, right, where God meets with us. We doubt, like Thomas, frequently. Sometimes we doubt. There are other times where we are capable of displaying great courage. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or, this is fascinating. Earlier on, the Gospel of John has more to say about Thomas than any other gospel. They have more stories about him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 16, Jesus, this is shortly before the beginning of Holy Week, Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to go into Jerusalem. And they know what a dangerous place that is for him at that time in his life. And uh, people are right, worried about what's going to happen if he goes to Jerusalem. And it's Thomas who speaks up and says, guys, let's go with him. Let's also go that we may die with him. Wow. If that is all we ever knew about Thomas, he would be known as Thomas the Courageous. That's what we'd be talking about this morning. So how does he go from Thomas the Courageous, willing to lay down his life for Jesus, in just a few days, he turns into Thomas the Doubting. You know, I read that, that story, I think of myself, I think of all of us because we as human beings are emotionally complex creatures. We, we can morph from a hero to a coward in a few minutes, depending on the circumstances that are around us. So as we move to our conclusion this morning, here is something we can learn from Thomas. Here is something we can take with us this morning. This morning. Thomas, Thomas's moments of bravery. Lord Jesus, I'm willing to go to Jerusalem and die with you. Thomas's mo moments of bravery are not what defined him. Thomas's moments of doubt are not what defined him. Right? All of us have moments in our life that we are proud of, uh, and all of us have moments in our life we would just rather forget. Come on. Someone has said that God doesn't take snapshots of our lives and base his judgment on those individual pictures. Our life is more like a motion picture where God takes into consideration not just what we were, not just what we did at some point in our life, but what we can become and, and what he's calling us to be and become. He looks at the whole picture from beginning to finish. Right? So wherever you are this morning, God has a plan for you this morning. God has a plan. He loves an honest doubter who's willing to take all of his doubts to him. You know, I've already said that Thomas accomplished amazing things in his life. After this event, he takes the gospel all the way to India. And, and before he died, it said that he established seven churches there in Jesus' name. Before he gave his life for the cause of Christ. Seven churches. And there's, I don't know, there's over a hundred of them now in, in the southern part of India. So he takes the good news all the way to India, but that was not the greatest thing that happened in his life. More important than what he accomplished is what he realizes at the end of this passage, which was the thing that motivated him to take the gospel all the way to India. He had this, his own personal encounter with Jesus. 
changes him. After Jesus says, Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. After, and he says, stop doubting and believe. After that event, Thomas says one of the most incredible things recorded in all of Scripture. It's like the revelation moment. The time God shows up. He realizes at this point that Jesus is more than a man. More than just a good teacher. More than a healer. Thomas had seen Jesus heal hundreds of people. That he was more than just a rabbi, more than just his friend that he traveled around Israel with for three years. And after this event, he, he looks at Jesus and says, my Lord and my God. He's the first one to say that. And then he says the most encouraging thing to me personally and to each and every one of us in this room this morning. Thomas, because you have seen me, you've had this remarkable experience. Because you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who haven't seen yet I've believed. What's so exciting about that is that's you and me. That's each and every one of us in this room. Uh, you know, he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, something I have never noticed before. In, in Matthew chapter 6 and in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus delivers these things called the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs are the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be com comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. People describe this verse in the Gospel of John as the last of the Beatitudes. It's the last one. Blessed are you who have not seen and yet believe. So our text goes on and ends this way. For all the doubters out there, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his di disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And in a, a statement of uh, an expansive statement, he's, he's making a point. Um, um, you know, if all the libraries in the world were written, they couldn't contain all the stories of Jesus. But these things are written that you may believe, that you may move from doubt to faith, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, and that by believing, by believing you, the doubter that you are, in spite of those snapshots of your past life that you would rather forget, by believing you might have life in his name. For every doubter out there this morning, everyone who doubts, for every doubter who is watching this message online this morning, God is here today by believing to offer you life in his name. So if the worship team could come up. Last song as I speak Jesus, right? There is power in the name of Jesus. You're not here just by coincidence, right? It's not a coincidence. God is here. He wants you to have a moment like Thomas had by placing your faith and your trust in him. You can do that today.
over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shall Jesus shall Jesus from the mountain Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness of Jesus, for this morning we feel. Thank you for this word. 
that the pastor prayed. Thank you, God, because even our daughter, we have a, some doubters sometimes, but uh, we can lift it up to you. And uh, we don't need to finger you asking for signs because we know that uh, you are here. Amen. Your presence is here. You never be alone us. And uh, thank you so much, God. And um, as we close in the service, we want to express our gratitude to you. Amen. We leave this place and know that uh, you are with us. Help us to continually turn our eyes to you in adoration and gratitude. We thank you for all bless us with the family and friends you surround us with. We thank you for the freedom we find in you. And may your days, church, be full of praise and worship of God and everything with which God has blessed us. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.